Chapter Eleven, Part One of the Albert Gate Mystery by Lewis Tracy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Carolyn. Chapter Eleven, Part One. A disconcerted commissary. The journey across Paris proceeded without further incident until they reached the prefecture. The two detectives hurried their prisoner into a large general office where he was surveyed with some curiosity by the subordinates lounging near a huge fire whilst one of their number reported his arrival after a brief interval he was taken into an inner office behind a green base covered table was seated a sharp-looking man whose face was chiefly composed of eyebrows pince a hooked nose and a furious imperial this individual turned the shade of the lamp so that the light fell in its full radiance on the face and figure of the prisoner he produced a huge volume and thumbed over its leaves until he reached the first vacant place ruled and numbered for the description of all persons brought before him your name he said sharply reginald brett was the reply the frenchman required this to be spelt for him age thirty seven nationality english profession barrister at law the official consulted a typewritten document which he selected from a mass of papers fastened by an india rubber band then he looked curiously at the prisoner are you sure this is the man he said to the senior detective quite positive monsieur then take off his wig and get a towel so that he may remove some of his make-up the rascal should be an actor i never saw a better disguise in my life Breton knew it was hopeless to attempt explanations at this stage he readily fell in with their directions and in a few seconds he stood revealed in something akin to his ordinary appearance now the french commissary of police was no fool he was an adept at reading character but he was certainly puzzled after a sharp scrutiny of brett's clear-cut intelligent features nevertheless he knew that the criminal instinct is often allied with the most deceptive external appearances so he turned to the detective and said tell me briefly what happened in accordance with instructions monsieur the man replied philippe and i ascertained the movements of the prisoner at the grand hotel during the afternoon he received messages from london and from some persons in paris which documents are now probably in his possession he quitted the hotel at eight o'clock disguised as you have seen he called for a moment at a house in the rue du chasse d'antin the number of which we noted and then made his way to the cafe noir in montmartre there we watched him from the door for nearly three hours he feigned drunkenness but held communication with no person ha huh, cried the commissary this struck him as an important point he made a memorandum of it soon after eleven o'clock he rose hastily and quitted the cafe crossed the boulevard and hailed a cab we would have followed him but there was no other vehicle in sight as our instructions were to arrest him at any moment he seemed likely to elude us we seized him he struggled violently and told us some story about his desire to follow another cab which he said had disappeared we saw no cab such as he described and we treated his words as a mere device to abstract attention we were right a moment later he made an attempt to escape and we were compelled to use considerable force to prevent him from being successful the commissary turned his eyes to the prisoner and was seemingly about to question him when brett said with a smile perhaps monsieur you will allow me to say a word or two certainly 
the official knew that criminals generally implicated themselves when they commenced explaining matters you are acting i presume said the barrister in obedience to reports received from the london police with reference to the murder of four turkish subjects at albert gate and the theft of some valuable diamonds belonging to the sultan this calm summary of the facts seemed to disconcert the frenchman it astonished him considerably to find his prisoner thus indicating so clearly the nature of the charge to be brought against him that may be so he admitted it is so went on brett and in this matter you are even more hopelessly idiotic than i took you to be i have told you my name and profession i am a friend of mr talbot the english gentleman who has been spirited away in connection with this crime and i have in my pocket at this moment a letter from the british under secretary of state for foreign affairs authorizing me to use my best efforts towards elucidating the mystery and tracking the real criminals here is the letter he continued producing a document and laying it before the amazed official i was on the point of making an important discovery with reference to this case when these two zealous agents of yours seized me and absolutely refused even whilst i was a prisoner in their hands to follow up the definite clue i had obtained it is an easy matter to verify my statements the authenticity of this letter will be proved at the british embassy whilst a telegram to scotland yard will place beyond doubt not only my identity but my bona fides in acting for mr talbot's relatives and the foreign office further an inquiry made at the grand hotel will produce unquestionable testimony from the manager who knows me and from my friend lord fairholme who occupies rooms there at this moment lord fairholme stuttered the official why that is the name given by the other prisoner do you mean to say you have arrested the earl of fairholme gasped brett struggling with an irresistible desire to laugh the frenchman covered his confusion by growling an unintelligible order and bent over the letter which brett had given to him in half a minute one of the detectives returned and with him was fairholme on whose honest face indignation and astonishment struggled for mastery oh surely that cannot be you brett cried his lordship the moment he entered the room well of all the blank fools that ever lived these french johnnies take the cake i suppose they have spoiled the whole business if the brutes had not taken me by surprise i would have knocked over a dozen of them before they arrested me silence shrieked the commissary into whose mind was intruding the consciousness that he had committed an outrageous blunder what did you say your name was he demanded fiercely i told you my name an hour ago said his lordship haughtily and if you had not been so beastly clever you would have believed me i am the earl of fairholme a fact that can be readily substantiated by dozens of people here in paris and this is mr reginald brett a friend of mine who would have probably discovered the mystery of my friend's disappearance and whereabouts of those diamonds if by this time you had not interfered his lordship was hardly coherent with annoyance but the acute official had now convinced himself that a stupid mistake had been committed by his department he became apologetic and suave he explained that their mysterious proceedings had to some extent committed them in the eyes of the police to secret knowledge of the crime which had so thoroughly aroused the detective departments in both london and paris evidently scotland yard had not advised the french police of mr brett's official connection with the hunt for the murderers the agents of the paris bureau had watched brett's comings and goings during the day and the detective's suspicions once aroused were intensified when his friend lord fairholme sought the aid of two uniformed policemen to break in the door of the turkish residence in the rue barbette even now politely concluded the commissary 
he would regretfully be compelled to detain them for a little while until he verified their statements meanwhile they would not be subject to any further indignities and might procure such refreshments as they desired they would probably be set at liberty within a couple of hours at one thirty a m brett and fairholme were ushered forth from the doors of the prefecture and stood in freedom in the street where now said fairholme to the hotel replied brett wearily i must have sleep so i consigned the turks and the sultan's diamonds and every one concerned with the albert gate mystery to perdition for the next eight hours notwithstanding his weariness brett rose early the next morning his companion slept like a top and the barrister had to shake the earl soundly by the shoulder before the latter woke into conscious existence and sat up in bed sleepily demanding what up where's the fire i want you to dress at once said brett cheerily and join me at breakfast you must leave for london by the eleven fifty train am i such a nuisance then that i have to be packed off at a moment's notice said the earl by no means decidedly the contrary in fact as matters in france evidently require persistent attention on my part for many days perhaps weeks i think it is hardly fair to leave talbot in confinement any longer your mission is to restore your prospective brother-in-law to the bosom of his family and i regret that it is impossible for me to accompany you are you serious old chap was the startled answer what has happened since one o'clock this morning to make you so confident nothing that is not already known to you had i succeeded last night in following mademoiselle beaucaire to her destination i might have been able to accompany you to london this morning as it is heaven alone knows what sort of dance she may lead me however you complete your toilette my dear fellow i have ordered breakfast to be served in a quarter of an hour then you can eat and listen during the first portion of the repast brett seemed too busily engaged to unburden his mind it was not until he had lit a cigarette and pushed his chair away from the table so that he could assume a posture of complete ease that he commenced you slept so soundly fairholme that you have not had time to review all the circumstances of yesterday's adventures otherwise i am sure you would have reached the same conclusions as suggest themselves to me curiously enough although dog-tired when i went to bed i woke about seven o'clock feeling thoroughly rested both in mind and body i procured some coffee took a bath and went out for a stroll with the result that i returned and aroused you after reaching finality in some of my conclusions and deciding on a definite plan of action for both of us it is really very decent of you brett to constantly assume that i can see as far through a brick wall as you can especially as you know quite well that although i am fairly well acquainted with all that happened yesterday the only tangible opinion i can offer is that the paris police interfered with you at a most inopportune moment brett smiled that is because you have not accustomed yourself to analysis he said however i will summarize my views and if you can find any flaws in my reasoning i will be glad the first thing to observe is that the diminutive frenchman drew on himself the special vengeance of the turks when i exposed the attempt to foist on them a collection of dummy diamonds yet he actually had the nerve to return to the rue barbette later in the day he was not seen since so the little scoundrel is either dead or a prisoner in hussein al mulk's flat as i cannot permit myself to participate in a murder or even in an illegal imprisonment i am regretfully compelled this morning to take the police into my confidence and inform them of an obvious fact which escaped their penetration yesterday fairholme whistled i must say he cried 
I gave a passing thought to the incident myself last evening, when your spy reported that the Frenchman remained in number 11 after the Turks had quitted it. Yes, said Brett. You see, all you need to cultivate is the habit of deduction, and you will soon become a capital detective. The Earl laughed. I hope you will tell that to Edith, he said, and perhaps you may change her opinion concerning my reasoning capacities. She thinks I am an awfully stupid chap as a rule. That is because she is in love with you, said Brett. Oh, well, no, that remark puzzles me more than anything else you have said. His lordship darted a quick look at the barrister in the endeavour to learn whether or not he was in a chaffing mood. Why should a woman seek to depreciate anything she values? Simply because it denotes a secure sense of complete ownership. Miss Talbot would never hold such a view of your intellectual powers if you were merely a friend. Well, said the earl dubiously, that is a new point of view for me at any rate. It is a fact, nevertheless, but we have not much time, so we must reserve any further consideration of feminine inconsistency. The fate of the Frenchman must be determined to-day, and to decide the question I must act through the police, so a conversation with our friend the commissary becomes inevitable. And now to return to the hypothetical part of my conclusions. I began by assuming that the individual who planned the Albert Gate outrage, and subsequently sought to bamboozle his employers by palming off on them a set of spurious diamonds, is far too acute to attempt to dispose of the real gems for many months yet to come. He obtained sufficient funds from the tax, in pursuance of what may be termed the legitimate part of his contract, to enable him to live for a considerable period without further excitement. Closely associated with him in the present adventure is La Belle Chasseuse. Neither would endeavour to procure safety by flight to a foreign country. They will seek insignificance by living in a normal and commonplace manner. What's more easy, for instance, for Mademoiselle than to return to the life of the circus, whilst her lover, granted that he wished to remain in her company, will obtain some suitable employment in the same circle? There is a suspicion of a joke in the statement, but I am quite serious. The mere consciousness that they have in their possession a vast fortune, which time alone will enable them to realise, will serve as an inducement to undergo the period of hard work which means safety. You remember that the lady's father, Grand Jean, visited the Gare du Lyon yesterday? Fairholm nodded. I think you will find that he was depositing there the necessary luggage for a contemplated trip into the interior, so that Mademoiselle might slip out late at night quietly and unnoticed, and join her lover at some preconcerted rendezvous, a thing which we know she did. I cannot, of course, be certain whether the Frenchman who signalled to her in the Café Noir was himself the favoured individual. It is possible. By the way, what height is Talbot? About five feet nine? Brett pondered for a little while. Yes, he communed aloud. I think I am right. The pink and white Frenchman is the mastermind in this conspiracy. And to think that the unintelligent muscles of a couple of thick-headed French policemen should have crudely interfered with me at such a moment. He sighed deeply. Never mind, he went on. It cannot be helped. I must keep on the thread of my story. Mademoiselle Beaucaire left the cabaret shortly after eleven o'clock. We cannot be certain that she went to the Gare de Lyon, but the cab unquestionably set off in that direction. It is a long drive from Montmartre to the Lyon station. We will give her, say, until twelve o'clock to reach there. Now, unless she was journeying to some suburban district, a contingency which upsets the whole of my theory, there was no main-line train leaving for the south until one five a.m., 
and that is a slow train stopping at nearly every station south of milan let us suppose that they guard against every contingency she and her companion wish to escape the scrutiny of detectives it will at once occur to you that they run far more risk of observation if travelling by a fast express than if they elect to journey by the commonplace trains which only serve the needs of country districts it did not occur to me said fairholme candidly still there is a lot in the idea all the same very well to sum up i imagine that the pair providing the two travelled together would break their journey south at some quiet town in the interior early in the morning and subsequently proceed to their destination by easy stages i am still forked as to what you mean by their destination said fairholme i mean the circus the music hall the cafe chantant or whatever place mademoiselle and her astute adviser may select as a safe haven wherein to avoid police espionage during the many months which must ensue before they dare to make the slightest effort to dispose of the purloined diamonds and how do you propose to follow them up i cannot tell at present my movements depend upon the result of the inquiries i shall make to-day in theatrical circles and particularly at the gare du lion where i shall not meet with success in any event until the night staff comes on duty the third item continued brett which demands attention in paris is the whereabouts of the turks they must be found and observed my chief difficulty will be to keep that delightful commissary from imprisoning them if as i imagine we find the little thief a captive in the rue barbette so you see my actions are speculative yours on the other hand will be definite ah said fairholme i am glad to hear that if you expect me to analyse and deduce and find out the probable movements of intelligent rascals i am sure i shall make a mess of things you will reach london said brett at seven thirty p m i suppose you have in your service a reliable servant endowed with a fair amount of physical strength rather cried the earl my butler is a splendid chap he has been fined half a dozen times for his exceeding willingness to settle disputes with his fists telegraph to him to meet you at charing cross station i can depend upon my man smith to use his nerve and discretion moreover he knows inspector winter of scotland yard and should trouble arise which i do not anticipate this acquaintance may be useful to you the third person who will meet you will be the ex-sergeant of police whose report to me you heard yesterday he will point out to you the flat tenanted by the invalid lady you speak french well and after a few questions you should be able to satisfy yourself whether or not the person who opens the door to you when you visit that flat is acting a genuine part you can pretend what you like but if admission is denied to you i want you to force your way inside and see that invalid lady at all costs in the event of a gross mistake having been committed you must apologize most abjectly and assuage the wounded feelings of the servants with a liberal donation whilst the ex-sergeant of police will advise you as to any other place which may demand personal inspection i do not conceal from you the difficulties of your task or the chance that you may get into trouble with the police but the fact remains that talbot alive or dead is concealed somewhere in the neighbourhood of the carlton hotel and it is high time that this portion of the mystery attending his disappearance should be made clear do you follow me precisely said fairholme my programme appears to be very simple i am to kick down any door that is pointed out by the ex-policeman provided i am refused admission by fair means brett laughed i think he cried you have put my instructions in very direct and succinct form 
all i hope is that the invalid lady may prove to be an elderly fraud it only remains for me to give you my blessing and say good-bye but what about you said the earl anxiously suppose we come across talbot to-night as you anticipate where shall i find you to-morrow you must telegraph to me here was the answer and you must possess your soul in patience until you hear from me no don't protest he went on as fairholme gave indications of impatience you need not fear that you will be left out of the denouement whatever it be i am sure to need your help before long and i will cable you at the first possible moment for that reason should you leave your house for more than an hour or so i hope you will make special arrangements for telegrams to reach you without delay you may rely on that was the hearty answer but look here brett it is ten forty five a m now if i have to catch that eleven fifty train from the gare du nord i have no time to lose by the way he added turning at the door is there any reason why i should not wire to edith to expect me to-night not the slightest said brett smiling except perhaps this that instead of calling on miss talbot this evening you may be locked up on the charge of housebreaking um said the earl thoughtfully i had not thought of that it will be more fun to take her by surprise so here goes to get my traps packed End of chapter eleven part one